I want to invite you to open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of John, chapter number 17. John, chapter number 17. It is truly an honor to get to be with you this evening. I'm very humbled at the fact that I get to share this time. I realize your time is very valuable, and I know there's many things that you could be doing. You set time aside to come to the house of God, and I am very thankful to stand here and to share the Word of God. I remember when I was in college that many times your pastor came through and he preached in the chapel services and many times even in the Bible conference. And I remember thinking, you know, I took notes like crazy. In fact, I probably preached some of his sermons. I didn't even want to say that, but I, I preached some of his sermons. But I translated them to Spanish. They became mine, preacher, to be honest, you know. But, you know, I thought, what a blessing. And now I, I get the opportunity to be here. I'm very incapable, per se, um, to be here. And uh, there's so many others who could do this. But I want to just take a couple minutes and I pray that it can be a blessing to you. The book of John, chapter number 17, very quickly allow me to give you a background of the book. Many times when someone was saved and the ministry of the Lord allowed us to work in, in Argentina, we would encourage them right away as they got saved, jump into the book of John. The book of John is a wonderful book to start out in. It's a wonderful book to read. It kind of covers from the very beginning of creation, the Lord Jesus Christ, and goes all the way through uh, the crucifixion, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can kind of divide up the book, if you wish. In chapter number 1 to chapter number 13, you can see the life and the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter number 14 to 16, you can see the, the Lord speaking to His disciples, saying, the Comforter is coming, the Holy Spirit. He's going to be leaving. The Comforter will be coming. Chapter number 17, we see that the Lord is now in the garden praying. Chapter number 18 and chapter number 19, the arrest, the trial of the Lord, the crucifixion of our Savior. Chapter number 20, he comes back. He's now resurrected. And chapter number 21, when he goes and he stands before his disciples, and of course when he stands before Peter and he says, do you love me three times? And then he says, well then, go feed my sheep. And what an encouraging book it is. What a wonderful book it is. I want to focus in, if we could, on chapter number 17 this evening for a few moments. And I want to talk to you about the theme in this chapter. Throughout this chapter, we see that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the garden. And he's there praying. It's very interesting to me because I can think about it and I can imagine many things I like to imagine and play it in my mind as if, if it was maybe a movie and you can imagine what's going on here. The Lord is, Lord is now getting ready to, they're getting ready to take him, but before he, they do, he goes into the garden and there he prays. Well, you remember in Matthew chapter number 6 back there, it taught the Lord said, I'm going to teach you how to pray. Remember, he said, Pray and say this, our Father which art in heaven. He was given a pattern of different ways to pray. But in John 17, he's not telling them how to pray. He's showing them how to pray. And so it's almost like you and I can grab a hold of the curtains of time and we can pull it back. And there as we pull it back, we see our Lord. And he's kneeling down and he's praying. And it's very interesting to me. Let's jump in this passage and let's see what is he praying about. The whole chapter is dedicated to the prayer of our Savior. So what is he praying about? Well, we jump in in verse number three to start off. The Bible says this. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So the Lord begins to pray here and he's speaking to his Father. This is 100% man, yet 100% God speaking to his Father in heaven. And he begins and he says that they may know thee. You know, all life is about knowing God. Knowing God in salvation and not even in salvation, but also knowing him intimately in our life. Brother Dallas just mentioned, no matter what stage you're at, no matter where you're at, each one of us should be reading the Word of God every day. As the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3, verse number 10, that I might know thee. That was the burden, the desire, the passion that drove him in his life. He wanted to know the Lord more. But it goes on down in this as he speaks in verse number 4. He says, I've glorified thee on the earth. I finished the work. Well, jump down. He continues on. Jump down all the way down to verse number 6, would you? And he begins the prayer. We're going to divide this into two different sections because he has two different things that he's praying for. Look at this, verse number 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou hast sent me. Now, who were these men that God gave to Jesus? These were, we know them as the disciples, the apostles, the followers of Jesus Christ. Well, look at what it says in verse number 6. Which thou gavest me out of the world, thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So he begins this prayer, and I want you to imagine with me, if you would, we pull back the curtains of time, and there he is. There's our Savior, and he's kneeling down and he's praying. We look in that room, and as we see our Lord in the garden, he's down there kneeling, he's praying. But what is he praying about? 
Well, the very first section that he begins to pray about, he says, I am praying. He's speaking to God and he says, I'm praying those that you have given me. Who were those? Those were the disciples, the followers, those students of Jesus Christ. In one way, they represent you and me. Those who are children of God, following God with our lives, disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you. But when sometimes someone sends me maybe a text message or shoots me a note or maybe even calls me or maybe even visits and says, hey, brother, just want to let you know I'm praying for you. That's encouraging news to me. I said, well, thank you. Lord knows I need that. But it's a whole different ball game when the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings is down there and he said, I am praying for these disciples. The Lord is praying for us. What a blessing. He's praying for you and he's praying for me. Remember, he tells us to enter into the throne. Boldly we can enter in. He was the one who tore down that middle wall of partition. So he's praying for us. But let's look specifically what he is praying about. If you have a pen, maybe we can underline a couple different things here. Find out what the Lord is praying. Now he's praying in the first section. He's praying for you. He's praying for me. He's praying for the disciples. So what specifically is he saying? There he is praying and jumped all the way down to verse number 13. Could we? The Bible says this, And now come I to thee, the Lord is speaking to God, the Father, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they, the disciples, might have my. Would you help me out with that next word? They might have my. What does it say? Joy. That they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So the very first thing is the Lord begins to pray and as he's kneeling down there and he's praying to our Father in heaven, you and I, by way of scripture, we can pull back the curtain. There he is kneeling and he's praying. What is he praying for? He's praying for you and me, but specifically what is he praying for? He's praying, first of all, that we might have joy. Would you say that with me? That we might have, what was it? Joy. Now just a few chapters back in chapter number 10, he said that they might have life and life more abundantly in abundance, right? That, that's what he gives us. And over and over, and so many times I see Christians that, boy, we're awful discouraged. And I realize there's so many problems and struggles and things in the world. But the Lord, as he begins to pray for you and me, he begins to pray that we might have, what was it? You know, remember over in Psalm 16, verse number 11, he says that in my presence is the fullness of joy. When we are close to our Savior, that's where the joy really is, right? You see, joy is not something that you possess or own. It's not something in your pocket. It's what you have in your heart. Amen. The Lord's been good to all of us. And so many times we love, please understand, I'm not pointing any fingers at you because when I point one at you, I've got three or four looking back at this ugly mug. But when we complain so many times, we're really praising the devil. We're really saying, God, you haven't, done, you haven't taken care of me. Listen, dear friend, as our Savior begins to pray, he says, Lord, God, may they have joy amongst this world with so many trials and temptations and struggles and sicknesses and problems. He says, may they forget all that. As the Apostle Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, what was it? Rejoice. And he wrote that from the jail cell. He wrote that when he was in the bad times and you and I would have said, boy, I would have loved to write my prayer letter from there. Buddy, I would have waxed eloquently, right? I mean, I would have told him, oh, woe is me. It's horrible in here. And Paul said, no, buddy, let's be joyful in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I mean, God's been good to us. And we need to remind us, ourselves how good God is to us. When was the last time you thanked God for how many things he's given you? When was the last time you thought about the blessings that God has given you? When was the last time you said, you know what? I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to use prayer as a big old long Santa Claus list and say, this is what I need and this and this and this. When was the last time you just stopped and said, Lord, I want to thank you. For salvation you've given me, for the good family you've given me, for the church you've given me, for the word of God, for the, the health you've given me, for the house, whatever it may. When was the last time? See, the Lord begins to pray and he says, first of all, I'm praying that they might have, what was it? Joy. But jump down. Let's go. Let's skip up a little bit. Verse number 11. Look what the Bible says here. And now I am no more in the world, but these, the disciples, are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be, next word, would you say that with me? That they may be, what does it say? One, even as, or excuse me, as we are. So imagine this with me. Here's the Lord. He's praying, oh, Father, please, I'm praying for the disciples. Give them, may they have the joy. Listen, dear friends, the devil knows that you and I, when we get discouraged, we never witness to other people. When we get discouraged, we don't read our Bibles. When we get discouraged, we don't visit and help other people. We don't pray for people. When we get discouraged, we don't want anything to do. And the devil many times says, I got them taken care of. No problem here. They're all discouraged. And how many Christians get discouraged? So the Lord prays that we might have joy, but not only that we might have joy, he also prays that we might be one, the Bible says. 
What does that mean? Or remember, there's 12 of them and they're walking around and many times as they would walk around, you remember some of the times they were back there fighting. There's 12 of them. They were in their groups, maybe of three or four, some say, and they were in those groups and they were fighting, hey, who's going to be the greatest among us, right? I mean, they were bickering back and forth and you remember even one time, James and John, they were, you know, maybe a little bit wimpy and they said, hey, you know what, mom, go ask them. And so his mom goes over and says, uh, could my, one of my sons sit on your right side and the other sit on your left? And the Lord says, you've got to be kidding me. Well, he doesn't say those words, but you don't understand what I'm saying. I mean, he says, no. And, you know, I mean, over and over, they're always bickering about something. And listen, the Lord says, as he said back in John chapter number 10, verse number 30, I and my father are one. And he looks and he says, may these disciples, may they be one as we are one. Now, let's be honest. With so many people, we're not ever going to agree on the color of the carpet or on the paint on the walls or on the food that we like or whatever it may be. But listen, as children of God, we can't agree on one thing. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ and we need to get it all around the world. Can we agree right there, dear brethren? Well, then let's many times, listen, we need to learn to die to ourselves and put other things aside and say, God, I'll prefer one another. I'll honor one another. I'll serve one another. I'll love one another. Let's put those things aside and let's put God first. May we be one so we can get the gospel out and other people can hear. But not only does he pray that we might have joy, not only does he pray that we might be one, but follow down there in verse number 14. Would you look at it very quickly? The Bible says this, I have given them, the Lord's speaking here, I have given them, the disciples, thy, would you say that? What does it say? The next thing, what does it say? I've given them thy what? Word. And the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So first of all, the Lord, there he is. He's praying for you and me, but what is he saying? He's praying for his disciples, but he's praying that we might have joy. He's praying that we might be one. And now he's praying, he said, I've given them thy word. You know what, dear friends, in this dark and dirty world that we live in, so much sickness, our dear brother was just saying, all the secularism that there is out there, all the nasty things. How in the world can we know how to raise our children in this world? Right here, this book will help you, dear friends. How can we know how to have a good marriage when even amongst Christians, it just seems like, you know, one out of two are just falling and divorcing. How can we know how to continue on in life? Right here, this book will tell you, dear friend. You see, this book, it's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He's not left us here. He said, here, I've given you the manual to help you out. Now, I've got five children. I'm half rabbit, dear friend. I've got five children and my children, many times, my wife, Whenever she gets something, I say, baby, let's buy something that's already put together. I've got no mechanical brain in my, it just doesn't work for me. My dad, he can take apart, and my mom would used to tell me, you know what, your dad, when he was 17 years old, he took car, uh, 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 apart a car, and he looked at it, and he put it together just a couple times. I'm thinking, mom, are you trying to make me feel stupid? I mean, I, if the car doesn't work, I say, doesn't work, baby. And she says, what's the matter? I'm saying, I don't know. Let's take it somewhere. I have no idea. Every once in a while, my wife will buy something. She says, here, they say it's easy to put together. And I said, who told you? The salesman said it's easy to put together. He knew we were suckers in buying that thing. Man, I can't put those things together. And I'll try, and you know, it ends up with the swing on the top or the leg out the side. I thought, this doesn't work. Take it back, you know. And then I end up with a whole big pile of screws. And I said, send this back to factory. These are all extras. It never works out for me. But you know what? At the very end, many times, I'll walk over and I say, give me that instruction manual. And I'll pull it out and I'll open it up and say, oh, would have been so much easier. Now, how in the world, in this world in which we live, dear friends, how do we know what to do? And the Lord says, don't you worry, dear friend. Here is the word of God that's sharper than a two-edged sword. Here's the meat for every day. Here's your bread for every day. Here's the milk of the word. Here's everything that you need to stay away from the temptations and the sin. We have the word of God, dear friends. So he's praying and he's saying, give them joy, God. He's praying, may they be one and die to themselves and, and prefer one another. Not one. May they be one and get the gospel out there. But not only that, may they grab a hold and read. May they use because I've left them thy word. But look down verse number 15 very quickly, that next verse. The Bible says this, I pray not thou that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. For a long time, to be quite honest, this kind of confused me. I thought, I mean, wouldn't it be easier just to take me on out of here? I mean, no problems, no struggles, no difficulties, no bills to pay and no people to argue with. and all. Wouldn't it just be easier, God, if you would have took me on out of here? And in the Lord, in chapter number 16, just uh, the chapter right before the very end verse, the Lord said, in this world you shall have tribulation. I thought, well, praise the Lord, what wonderful news we got. 
He said, hey, in this world you'll have tribulation. Hey, but then he says, stop, rejoice, be joyful. I am with you. You have nothing to worry about. I am right by your side. So listen, here's what he says. God, don't take them out of here. There'll be no light here. But God, keep them away from the evil. We have his presence, dear friend. We have the help that we need. We have all that we... God has not just thrown us out there and said, fend for yourself, boys. He said, I've given them thy word and now I'm keeping them. I am helping them. I'm watching over them. I'm protecting them. Listen, dear friends, we have so many blessings as a child of God. We know where we're going when we die. We have the presence of God every day. We have blessings all the time. God has been good to us. And so we see here the Lord. There he is kneeling down and he's praying. And buddy, it excites me. I look at it and I say, wow, he's praying for me. I mean, goodness, how in the world? For me, he's praying and what is he praying about? He's praying that I might have joy, that I may be one, that I, he's given me his word. He's going to keep me in this world. But it doesn't end there. Flip to the other side. And now we see as we go on down in this passage, he changes direction in his prayer. Look at it, would you? Verse number 20. The Bible says this, Neither pray I for these alone. That pronoun, these. Who are the these? The these are, these are the disciples. So imagine... He says, now he's here praying. He says, neither God, I'm praying that they might have joy, that they may be one. He's praying for us. And then he says, but I'm not only praying for them. For who? For the disciples. I'm not just praying for them, for you and me. But look what it says in verse number 20. Neither pray for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. Now follow with me one second. Here he is, he's praying. Who's he praying for? He's praying for you. He's praying for me. But then he said, God, I'm praying for them that they might have joy, that they may be one. Here's their word. I'm going to keep them here. But then he stops and he says, but I'm not only praying for these guys. I'm praying for all these people out here that will believe. But how are they going to believe? He says, they will believe. They shall believe according to their word. You and I opening our mouth, using our voices, using our lives, using our time, using our treasure, using all that we have. When we begin to open up and say, God, we are your instruments. He said, that's what I'm praying for. Now, many times I look at my life. I used to love to read missionary biographies. To be quite honest, when I was in school, I did a, let's just say I, I did a lot of cheating through school. Okay, all through school. And I got all the way up into high school and I got saved and God got a hold of my heart. And boy, I just thought, man, I got to get things on the ball. And so I started studying and I remember it was hard to study, to read a book. They said, read a book. And I said, you got to be kidding. What do you not have anything else to do? Man, I remember walking in there in the library and I'd pull something off and they said, do a book report. And I said, well, what is a book report? And they said, well, you got to read a book and then you got to make a summary on it. I thought, are you serious? What do you think? I don't have anything else to do? So I walked in the library. I pulled off a book off the shelf and I looked and on the back of the book, lo and behold, by God's great goodness, someone had already wrote the book report for me. I thought, God bless you, author. So I wrote it down. I changed a couple of the words so it could be mine, right? I mean, it wasn't pure forgery. And so sure enough, I changed it. I turned in. Man, I cheated my way all through school. I get saved and the Lord gets a hold of my heart and I thought, Lord, I got to start doing what's right. Lord started working in all kinds of different areas. And so I remember I get all the way to college and I thought, it's going to be a miracle if I get out of here. You know, I mean, it seemed like when I was there that every teacher tried to, you know, top the other teacher. You walk in, they're like, look around you. There's only going to be maybe half of you at the end of the year. And I'm like, oh, you serious? I'm like, way to go. You know, I'm thinking, I'm not going to be making this. They said, in my class, you're going to study this many hours. We're going to have a quiz every Monday and Wednesday and Friday. You're going to study two hours. You're going to read it three times and underline it and make the, and I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I go to the next class. He said, my class, other classes might be easy, but my class isn't. I thought, are you guys in cahoots here? I mean, what's going on? I thought, I'm not going to get out here. Well, finally, by God's great miracle, I get out. I get married. I'm a very patient man. My father-in-law said I had to wait to get married until I graduated. So I was able to finish college early and I waited a whole about two weeks. And I said, baby, we're getting married. But we got married and we hit the road of deputation, traveled around. And while we were traveling for a year and a half in the United States, picking up our support, heading over to Argentina. Man, it was wonderful. I was enjoying it. And my wife would sit next to me and she would read missionary biographies. And man, I would fill my heart. It gave me a zeal and a fire. And I said, God, that's what I want to do. I'd read these biographies and I would see how men would give their lives and they would give their, 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 their families, their time, their all. They would serve God. And I looked at it, but many times I would stop and I'd say, that's awesome, but God, not me. 
I mean, I don't come from good pedigree per se. I don't have money and I don't have the knowledge and the talents. And God, that's not me. And so the Lord says, I'm praying for these, the missionaries. I'm praying for the disciples, but I'm also praying for all those that will believe, but they will believe according to your word. And I said, God thinks, but how are you going to use me? I'm a nobody. Well, look what the Bible says, because God says he equips us and gives us exactly what we need to get the job done. Would you look at it? Jump on down to verse number 22, and the Bible says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, the disciples, that they may be one, even as we are one. So how are we supposed to? The Lord's praying for the disciples, and he says, Look, guys, don't you be, you know, egotistical, thinking it's all about you. I also want to pray for all those that will believe one day, but they're going to believe because of you guys. I say, Lord, how? How in the world? And the Lord says, Don't you worry. I've given you my glory that God has given me. Now, God doesn't share his glory. So what does that mean? You can go to chapter number 1 and chapter number 2, verse number 11, where he says he's given us that glory. But what does that mean? Well, I believe it comes from Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, where he says, hey, y'all are going to be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the other parts of the other. God gives us his authority. God gives us the boldness. God gives us the strength. God gives us exactly what we need. As Philippians 2, 13 says, it's him that worketh both in us to the will and the do of his good pleasure. God says, I put the desire in your heart. And don't you worry about the tools. I'll take care of that part. If God puts something in your heart to say, well, God, I think maybe I can go to the mission field. Don't you worry about the details. God's going to take care of those things. You say, well, preacher's talking about giving. And Lord, I, I know there's something in my heart to give the faith promise, but I don't know if I can do that. God's going to take care of it. Well, I don't know. God might want to take my kids to the mission field. Don't you worry about it. God can protect them way better than you ever could. But I don't know about that. Listen, whatever your doubt is, God says, I've given you exactly what you need to get over there and do the work of God. We have the authority that God has given us. We have the blessings that God has given us. We arrived into Argentina for many years. For a year and a half, we traveled through the states and raising our support. And our prayer always was, Lord, please prepare the heart of the Argentines over and over and over. It was our constant prayer between my wife and I. We finally leave the United States. We learned the language. We arrived to Argentina and I began to pray and I said, God, I've been praying for a long time that you'd prepare the heart of the Argentines, Lord. Now, God, I'm asking that you would send all those people whose heart you've already prepared. And you might think this is silly or too simple. Maybe it's way simple. But you know what? Little by little, God began to send people. God sent them there. And I thought, man, I don't even know if I can speak this well. I don't even know if I'm doing what's, well, what's right. Man, I cleaned up this old paint building. We started. People started to come. And man, they would get rid of things. And they would say, I'm going to quit with the alcohol. I'm going to serve the Lord of heaven. And they quit beating their wives. They quit doing these things. Boy, God, I said, God, I want to be on a radio. And a man walks in and he said, would you like my radio station? And I said, are you kidding me? And I mean, over and over, I can tell you all kinds of miracles that happen over and over. And God began to send men that would study in the Bible college and go out and start churches and serve the Lord. And I thought, God, I'm nothing. And the Lord said, don't you worry about it. I'm the one who wants them saved. I'm praying for them. I'll give you the glory. Now get out there and do the job that I told you to do. And when God speaks to us, dear friends, do not look and use our logic and say, well, Lord, you know things are pretty tight. Lord, you know that I've been wanting little Junior to be a, a doctor for many years. And Lord, you know that I've been wanting, Lord, I can't go out there and I can't use my vacation to be a, on a mission trip. Lord, I can't do these different things. The Lord says, don't you worry, but I've given you exactly what you need. I'll take care of you. But not only does he give us his glory, look very quickly. Last verse, number 26. This is what the Bible says. And I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. The Lord, he's praying for you and for me. There he is. He's kneeling down. He's praying that we might be one. He's, given us, he's praying that we might have joy. He's praying. He's given us his word. He's going to keep us. He's praying for us. But then he says, not just praying for y'all. I'm praying for all those that will believe. And we say, well, how are they going to believe? And the Lord says, by your word, me? He said, don't you worry about it. I've given you my glory, the authority. Get out there and do it. And then he says, Lord, and he says, God, Father, the same love you've given me, I've given them so they can get out there and do the job. You see, the love of God, the love of God that sent his son to this world, the love of God that shines brightly, the love of God in which many countries, as Brother Reese said very clearly, 95%, probably 99% do not know Jesus Christ. And when we look at the 7 billion of the world, they say easily maybe 4.5 billion do not even know who Jesus Christ is. And our Savior says, I've given you my love. 
Don't you hold it up into yourself. 1 John 3, 17 says, He which hath the goods of this world and shutteth up his, and seeth his brother in need and shut up, the, up his bowels of compassion, how dwelt the love of God in him? Well, not talking about the material, but when you and I have the greatest thing that this world could need, which is salvation, and we see our brethren according to the flesh, as, Ro as Romans 9 and Romans 10 said, Paul looking to the Jews said, they are my brethren according to the flesh. When we see the world's great need and we own salvation, we have it in our hands, how can we shut up our bowels of compassion, dearly beloved? We must get it out there. We have people here that said, you know what, I'll give my life. Listen, and maybe God's dealing with your heart. Here's the prayer of our Savior. It's very simple. It's very easy. Listen, the first half he's praying for you and he's praying for me. What an encouragement. But he doesn't only pray for us. He prays for all those that will believe. And until my Savior comes back to take me home, I am so convinced there are millions of people all over this world who still will be saved. But the question is, will you have a part? You see, he said they will be saved. They will hear. But you and I are in the, in the equation. We're right smack down in the middle. We're right there. So the question is this. He is praying and wants to use you so that other people can hear. Will you let him use you? God says, I'm praying for you, but I'm praying for all these other people. Will you give your heart? Will you give your life? This isn't a plea for money. This is a plea for your heart. This is a plea for the deepest and, and most intimate portion of your, of your being. This is a plea saying, would you give whatever God says and say, God, here's my life. And when we start with the heart, everything else just kind of falls into place, dear friend. So he says, I want them to hear. As Paul said, coming to the end of his life in Acts chapter 28, they said, you know what? I don't want to hear. I don't care. And Paul said, fine, I'm going to the Gentiles. They will hear. There's people all over this world. They will hear if they have the opportunity. You and I talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Much of the world has never heard of the first coming. Will we show the love of Jesus Christ? He's praying for us, but he's praying to use us so that other people can hear. Can we bow our